Morning, everyone. Just uh, give you a chance to take your seats. Good morning. Um, welcome to Celebration Church on this Sunday, October 27th. Um, another beautiful Sunday. A little bit colder, but that's normal, actually, for us. Um, my name is Ann Wong, and I'll be chairing today. Um, I also want to welcome the people um, on Zoom who are joining us this morning. Um, and uh, let's begin with the call to worship. Praise the Lord in every time and place. We will tell of God's goodness each day. Boast only in the Lord. We will praise God's wonderful deeds. Spread the news of God's greatness. We'll give God glory everywhere we go. So let us worship God together, here and now, now and always. I will now read the um, prayer of adoration and followed by the prayer of confession, which we will recite together. Lord God, loving God, we gather as your servants shaped by the faithfulness of those who went before us and taught us the name of Jesus. In Christ, you call us together to praise your name and serve your world in his name. With the kindness of you, Spirit, feed the roots of our faith and renew our vision for the church in this generation. Fill us with courage and confidence to reach out to others with your mercy and grace. For you are our God, ever faithful to your people. Lord of love and mercy, you are the source of every good and perfect gift. We, but we confess our gifts to you are less than perfect. We honor you when it fits into our schedules. We forget that your love should set our priorities and pursue our own desires. Forgive our wavering hearts and reawaken our commitment to you. Amen. Friends, we are promised that those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Claim your hope in this good news. God's perfect love abides in you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thanks be to God for such great mercy. Amen. I'll invite the praise team up. Um, the first song that we're going to be singing will be Lord of All. The artist that wrote the song is Kristen Stanfield, and he got his inspiration from Psalm 97. I'm just going to read a few verses from that. Um, the Lord reigns, let the earth be glad, let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all people see his glory. For you, Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Let those who love the Lord hate evil, for he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. 
Light shines on the righteous and joy on the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. Please stand if you're able as we sing Lord of All. Wonder and awe surround you, Lord. Glory and power light your way. Day after day, the heavens proclaim the beauty of the Holy One. We will respond. joy and a song. Your enemies rise, your enemies fall, your fire consumes them all. There is none so high and holy, King of kings, the one and only. verse 17 the Lord your God is in your midst a mighty one who will save he will rejoice over you with gladness he will quiet you by his love he will exult over you with loud singing music is such a wonderful gift of the church offering us a chance to lift our voices singing to God in this verse from Zephaniah though we see a different picture one of God singing over us and here's an interesting thing to note both kinds of singing are centered in joy. Out of joy, we sing to God and lift him up as the only one worthy of worship. And out of joy, God sings over us and holds us close to those who discover our worth in his love and saving grace. This image from the prophet calls to mind a parent holding their child, finding joy simply in who they are. Let us sing the Father's song.
Please join me as we pray and as we end with the Lord's Prayer. Lord, we pray that, uh, we pray that you will work in the lives of, of us, Lord, here in the congregation as we receive God's word, as we grow closer to Christ, as we walk through our daily trials. May Pastor Peter Ma's sermon reach the congregation and we can apply the learnings and insights to our lives through Pastor Peter's words. Thank you, Lord, for the team that we sent last week to the Evangel Hall mission. Thank you, Lord, that everything went smoothly and they were able to provide food for about 200 needy individuals. We pray for those who are going through illness, those that we know people that are going through illness in our lives, those that are suffering through latest surgeries or procedures, those of us that could be waiting for test results from our medical exams. Lord, often it feels like we're living between test results. I pray that you will take away the anxiety and make each, so that we can make each day glorifying to you. We pray for those who are dealing with unemployment or underemployment or the stress or the, uh, just the, the feelings of, uh, of anxiety and, and, and um, the negative feelings that just come with that, Lord. I pray that you will help alleviate that and provide for us, Lord, who are going through these difficulties and their families. We pray for parts of the world that are going through turmoil, that you will bring peace and relief. We thank you, Lord, we live in a part of the world where it is um, peaceful and, and calm, be it through weather or, or wars, Lord. And as we enter this autumn season, may we use this time to reflect and walk with you and remember others and continue to care for them. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Just a few quick announcements. Um, Immediately after service today, we're having the membership class with uh, Pastor Peter. Did you want them to meet back here or in the side, in the side um, room? Um, also, we have an announcement about OCC. Is Olivia here? Yes. Are you making an announcement? Children, oh.
open their boxes, you can hear the laughter, the cheer. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. I want the children to know that Jesus Christ is alive and he'll come into each and every heart that invites him. The mission of Operation Christmas Child is to share the gospel with children around the world. Because we bring gifts to the children, the mothers and the fathers accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. This box gives us a chance to show them that there is a light, there is a truth. Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. So we need to keep packing those boxes and continue to pray for the children around the world as we begin to disciple them. God bless you. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so now that we're moving into November, um, now is the time for Operation Christmas Child. Um, so I know that our church has been involved with Operation Christmas Child for quite some years now, but um, for those of you who might not know what it is, um, OCC is, uh, is a project that aims to spread the gospel and to share the message of hope and love by providing shoeboxes just like these, filled with supplies and toys um, that we can um, give to children in need all around the world. Uh, so looking at the journey of a shoebox, we can be the ones who start to pack them um, before they get processed and then shipped to different countries. And we actually have empty shoeboxes that you can bring home today, so they'll be in the fellowship hall after service. So the countries that you see here are, the, are where all of the boxes will be going from Canada this year. And if you can see... There we go. Cape Verde has been added as one of the destinations this year. Uh, so I also want to mention that we're going to be a collection center again this year. Um, so we'll be packing some more shoe boxes and also collecting boxes from the community. So if you're interested in volunteering, you can just let me know or Auntie Mary as well, um, and we can sign you up for uh, and put you into that volunteer schedule. Um, oh, sorry. My bad. Um, we'll also be collecting money, as we have in the past, to purchase uh, different items that will also go in the shoe boxes, which we'll be packing together uh, at our packing party. Um, so if you'd like to donate, you can do that through push pay as well, and just select the missions option and indicate that it's for OCC. All right, that's everything. Thanks. Oh, okay. Are there any more announcements? Okay. Uh, today's scripture reading comes from Matthew 13, 24 to 30, and 36 to 43, the parables of the weeds. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. The parables of the weeds explained. Then left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The son of man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. This is the word of the Lord. So thank you, Olivia, for the announcement and also the scripture reading today. Just want to mention a few things 
before starting. First of all, I uh, want to thank the session for uh, the work that they are doing. First of all, in leading the services and organizing and being, uh, being good and kind and giving to everybody. So thank you for that, um, making decisions in session and kind of moving forward as a church. It's not easy, uh, but uh, things are moving along. And I think the session is doing a, a wonderful job. And God is the one that's kind of pulling us all together. God is the one that uh, is at work uh, more than we are at work in the midst. So I think that's most important. Uh, another thing is, as a session, uh, the session decided to, um, to uh, meet with uh, Unionville Presbyterian Church. So uh, we had a request to have a joint service at Christmas. So we're going to have a joint service on December the 15th. And we've also been invited to a potluck. So a potluck also is uh, joint as well. So more information will come around that. And basically, um, we're, first of all, we're very thankful for the the kindness and the graciousness of Unionville Presbyterian Church. And we also are called to uh, give and to show kindness and love um, to all people. And so we take that as um, a wonderful opportunity to do so for Unionville Presbyterian Church. Um, we are recognized that we're not always the same in the way that we do things, in the way that we approach things. But I know that this uh, session, and I know that for ourselves, we. Um, uh, we understand who we are and what we are called to do as a church. And so we're not looking to like just, we're looking to be good and kind to everybody and including um, Unionville Presbyterian Church. So we're thankful uh, for that opportunity. So just to let you know, more information will come and, um, and we'll move forward in that. Um, if you do have any concerns or comments or things like that, uh, definitely you can talk to uh, any member of session any of the elders, or myself too, I'm, I'm open and interested to chat as well. Um, one thing about Operation Christmas Child, we have someone in the community that really wants to come. So we're gonna like uh, see if we can make that work out. Um, this person has some, uh, is in a wheelchair, but that she wants to come, and so we're excited about that as well. And there is a new uh, Flow newsletter out, so that's the work that I'm involved in, Flow Without Bounds Ministries. There's a newsletter that just came out. It, was, uh, it wouldn't have happened without the help of Eva, and so we're thankful uh, to Eva for all of her work putting it together. Uh, and so um, I think that's in the weekly email for the church as well. So some announcements. Uh, today we're looking at uh, the parable of the wheat and the weeds, or the parable of the wheat and the tares, or simply the parable of the weeds. And this speaks about the frustrations we feel at times. Uh, we, um, we know that things aren't right, uh, and that sometimes it shouldn't be this way, or here we are trying to follow God and do what's good and right, but, but there are obstacles, there are frustrations, there are... There are um, difficulties. So why do we have to put up with the weeds? You know, why is evil still at work, still present in this world and in our lives? What, these are the weeds of our lives. I have my own weeds story. It happened probably about 10 years ago. Uh, it was in the spring and I ordered some, some soil uh, for the lawn. Oh, oh I'm going to go this way. <laughs> <laughs> ordered some soil for the lawn. It was, I think it was like top dressing or triple mix or something. I can't remember. But I wanted to like enrich the lawn to make it like grow better and, and healthier. Soil came in a dump truck and um, they dumped it on the front lawn. And it was a lot of work to spread around. <laughs> Anything outdoors, it seems to be like a lot of work. So after a while, uh, the work got done. Um, what I didn't realize and what we didn't realize was that after a few weeks, um, weeds started growing up everywhere, like strange weeds. We had never seen them before. And it turns out there, we got, we got extra things that came with the soil, right? There was like little seeds of weeds of other things and it was all over the place and we were not happy. 
you know, why did we have to have these weeds come up on our lawn? And so we started like working at it to, to, to weed the lawn and actually took like a few years to kind of um, take care of all of these weeds. And we still have some clover on the lawn that I still blame on that, that pile of soil. I mean, that happens in life, doesn't it? Uh, we try to do something to improve, but then there are setbacks. That's two steps forward and one step back, or sometimes even just one step forward and two steps back. I mean, has this ever happened to you? It's hard when things aren't right. When we're trying to do what's good and right and other things or other people stand in our way or people mess things up or even the devil is at work against us. It's annoying and it's also normal. It's normal. It's part of what it means for the kingdom of God to grow in this world and in our world today. So we're back looking at Matthew chapter 13. And in this chapter, Matthew records uh, Jesus teaching in parables. Uh, Jesus explaining some of these stories later on in the chapter uh, to his disciples. And this is the case today. We have the parable of the sower, or, sorry, parable of the weeds, and then we have an explanation as well. Uh, the first parable in Matthew 13 is the sower and the soils where uh, a sower is just spreading seeds. And there's four different kinds of soil. One is along the path, which is hard ground. Another is along uh, uh, rocky soil, which flourishes, but it doesn't last. Another is among thorns, where it grows, but it gets choked out uh, by, the, by the thorns. And then some seed falls along good soil, and it produces a crop many times over. So these are stories of the kingdom. These are stories that Jesus told uh, that give us some information about the kingdom of God. And many parables begin with Jesus saying, the kingdom of heaven is like, or the kingdom of God can be compared to. So these stories aren't just like fables, or they're not just like good stories with a moral to them. These stories carry with them great spiritual meaning. They are windows into spiritual truth about God and how God works in this world and how the kingdom of God is at work. So this second parable, Matthew 13, is our scripture reading. It's the parable of the wheat and the weeds. I just have a picture, oh, I went backwards again, a picture of um, a sower. It's just a, uh, one of the classics from Van Gogh. It's a simple farming story. A farmer planted wheat seeds, uh, grains in his field, but in the middle of the night, an enemy came and sowed uh, weeds as well. And no one knew what was happening until much later when everything started to grow and ripen. Now, just to think about wheat, there's something beautiful about a wheat field, isn't there? Like just wheat growing in the field is just beautiful. Unless, of course, you have a gluten allergy and then it, like, it would be a nightmare, right? But imagine heads of grain just swaying in the wind. It's beautiful. The problem is that the weeds were planted and this is something like um, what they presume it was, was like a rye grass uh, called the bearded darnel, which grows in lots of places, included the, the Middle East. And it looks similar to wheat. It's hard to tell the difference until the grains appear. Uh, the real problem is that uh, the, weeded, the, the bearded darnel um, has kind of a fungus sometimes that grows with it, or the outside of the, 
the germ um, can be toxic to livestock and humans. It can cause dizziness and nausea. So in the parables, the workers notice, like, this wheat, it doesn't look quite right. And as time goes on, they realize that there is something noxious and dangerous growing. These weeds are growing in the middle of their field, and they ask their master, should we pull this up? But the master tells them, surprisingly, not to do anything because it would uproot the wheat as well. Instead, wait for the harvest where the workers will uproot the weeds and have them burned and then gather in the good grain. Well, that sounds like an agricultural plan, but what does this tell us about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven? How can this be spiritual truth for us today? And I want to make a couple suggestions. Simply this. First, to live with tension, and second, to withhold judgment until the end. Uh, Live with tension, withhold judgment until the end. So let's look at that first suggestion. The workers want to pull up these weeds by the roots. I mean, we would normally do that. If you see a garden that has weeds in them, is your natural inclination to pull up the weeds, or or to ask someone else to pull up the weeds, perhaps, right? Uh, That's our natural inclination. So it's disturbing to see this field of wheat, which can be so beautiful, being threatened by harmful weeds, weeds that are noxious and even poisonous to livestock and even to people. It's jarring to see a field this way. There is tension, and they want to do something about it. And this is the idea of the kingdom of heaven that is here, but is not yet. The kingdom is here, but is not yet. The now and the not yet. The, the, kingdom, has come, the kingdom has come, but it's not fully established in the world or in our lives, even in our lives yet. In other words, there is still evil in the world. God still allows the prince of darkness or the devil to have influence in the world. We still have pride and selfishness and sinful thoughts that can lead us astray. Unfortunately, that's part of what it means to live in the now and the not yet. And we look around the world and we see um, the effects of evil and sin and selfishness. People are suffering and dying because of of others, because because of evil in the world. And at times we can despair at this injustice or we can become cynical at the state of the world. It happens all around us, and it happens all over the world. And so we live with this tension that things are not as they should be. The danger is that we take it upon ourselves too much. We take on too much of the problems of the world or too much of the problems of our families or the problems around us or even the problems of our church. And we put that on our shoulders and we're going to fix it. We're going to take care of this ourselves. But the danger is that in the process, we ourselves can become uprooted or spiritually disconnected and dry. A youngster was asked by his mother to weed the garden. And to get out of the job, the boy would kind of said, well, I don't even know what I'm supposed to pull up. But the mother, uh, she replied, she said, everything is planted in rows and it's marked. So pull out anything that doesn't belong. Well, the son grudgingly went out to the garden and started weeding. And sometime later, the, 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 
the boy's mother decided to inspect the work of her son and she went out and she noticed something was wrong and she found her son and she said, what happened to all the asparagus? <laughs> to which he replied, you told me to pull out anything that doesn't belong and asparagus definitely doesn't belong. You know, the lesson here is that we can uproot the wrong plants. And in fact, in our zealousness to make things right and to get rid of tension, we can uproot ourselves. We can uproot others. In the parable, it's okay to live with tension. There can be this healthy tension, a healthy uneasiness, dis-ease with the world we live in. And according to this parable, now there are other passages in the Bible that speak about other things, but according to this parable, uh, it's when we try too hard to fix it all. Shall we pull everything up? Shall we get rid of these weeds? It's when we try too hard to fix it all and do it in our own way that we can uproot the wrong plants. Reminds me of a time when I was driving north on Kennedy and I noticed this car that was going very slow and it was weaving in its lane and I looked closer and there's this lady, she was trying to write something on a notepad while she was driving. And I was like, um, I said out loud to myself with the windows rolled up, I said, like, lady, you shouldn't be writing while you're driving. And while I was saying that, um, I started to drift in my own lane. Thankfully, there were no other cars around, but I was drifting to the next lane. And it made me... Um, made me realize, right, uh, there's danger when we try too hard to solve other people's problems, uh, solve everyone else's problems. Uh, so that leads to the second suggestion, withhold judgment until the end. Surprisingly, these workers are told that they don't need to discern or judge between the wheat and the weeds. They don't have that capability or the responsibility that will be taken care of in the end. And let me suggest the lesson here is not to do nothing. The lesson here is um, not to stay on the sidelines, right? So we're not supposed to just, oh, well, that means that I don't have to do anything, right? Um, that doesn't mesh or jive with other passages of scripture where we do have a calling and a purpose and a mandate and a commission uh, to spread the good news and to love other people with the love of Christ and to pray for those who persecute us and to make disciples. We are called to do these things. But we are also called in this passage to withhold judgment until the end. The truth is that we need God to be our righteous judge. I was talking with someone early this week and one of the questions that they had was like, you know, there's been so much wrong, done wrong and how could, you know, um, how could Christians, first of all, do all these wrong things? And then secondly, how could a loving God, you know, send um, people to hell as well? And I think part of the answer to that is, first of all, the need for God to be our righteous judge. We need God to judge between the nations, according to Isaiah chapter 2. Um, that God is, that we will face judgment in 2 Timothy chapter 4. That there is a coming judgment where after death, um, we will all face, uh, we'll all have to stand before the throne. According to Matthew 25, Hebrews 9, 1 Peter 4, Revelation 20. And even this parable speaks about a final judgment where the weeds are burned and the wheat is gathered. 
This parable speaks about hell as a blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And it speaks about heaven as a place that shines like the sun in the kingdom of our Heavenly Father. I think of it like this phrase, wait until your father gets home. Wait until your father gets home. Those were the days when well, when the traditional roles of the family uh, was the father was the disciplinarian, laid down the law. And of course, the truth is that in any family, there does need to be some discipline, at least some amount. Parents do need to lay down the law. It may not necessarily be only the father or the father who is the disciplinarian. But families don't work very well when there is no discipline, no boundaries, and no rules. Think of two kids, a brother and sister, who get into an argument, they end up in a fight. Wait until your father gets home. Means that it will be sorted out soon. Think of a son or a daughter who has become rude and disrespectful and angry. You know, wait until your father gets home means that it will be dealt with in time. Now, our earthly fathers are not perfect. Um, They have had problems of their own. They didn't always understand. They don't always see clearly or well. Um, Sometimes they don't listen, and sometimes they don't make very good judgments. But when it comes to our Heavenly Father, we have one who is righteous, which means that God only does what is good and right. And we have a God who is holy, which means that there is no hint of evil or selfishness or sinfulness. And according to this parable, we can leave judgment to God, who is our righteous judge. Justice and judgment will be taken care of. We can withhold judgment until the end. 1 Corinthians 4 5 says, Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. And at that time, each will receive their praise from God. So in this verse, 1 Corinthians 4, the context is people judging Paul and Apollos or Peter, and Paul tells the Corinthian church not to do that. The understanding is that there is a final judgment that will set things straight. There is a final judgment that will distinguish between the wheat and the weeds, but that final judgment is also for us as well. And according to the Bible, the answer is very simply, the answer to that final test is very simply, Jesus. It's accepting the gift of Jesus with humility and receiving the grace of Jesus and allowing God's grace to be in our lives and is following the footsteps of Jesus to live as Jesus lived. And it's entrusting our lives to Jesus. So our confidence is not in ourselves and in our own judgment. Our confidence is in Christ. So live with tension and withhold judgment until the end. According to this parable, These parables that Jesus told, they're simple stories, but they invite us to something more, to have insight into the kingdom of God, to discover spiritual meaning. And that's true for this parable, the wheat and the weeds. Let us pray. Lord, 
Thank you that you call us to something. But at times we're not exactly sure what you call us to. How to live in this world. How to be present. How to allow your kingdom to grow. Thank you, Lord, that we, first of all, have you. And that you are a righteous judge. And you are the one who does what is good and right. And we thank you for your teaching. So teach us to follow your way and your truth and to allow your grace into our lives. And teach us how to live in this world, which is at times difficult and troubling and frustrating. Give us faith to see that your kingdom is growing. Give us a trust in you that in the end, you will make things right. Help us not to become cynical or selfish or just angry or judgmental, but help us to leave judgment to you in whatever way that means. But Lord, you also call us to something. You call us to live in this world and to be your disciple. We thank you. Spirit, Holy Spirit, would you guide us into your way and guide us into truth and show us um, what you have before us, what you call us to do this day. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to take time to celebrate communion together, so uh, let's gather around uh, the table. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. No one who comes to me will I drive away because there is one bread and we who are many are one body for we all partake of one bread. So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. So the invitation is to come and to be present with Christ. Together we uh, have this common unity, and that is in the sacrifice of Christ. Uh, so let's recite the Apostles' Creed together. Let's stand uh, as you're able. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again, and he ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So please be seated. And we have a responsive, so let's share in this response. Oh, thank you for advancing. So the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let's take this time to pray. Lord, truly we give you thanks and praise. You are the almighty God, and we live in your world. 
You are always creating and sustaining by your power. You have created us so that we can know and love and trust you and serve you. And thank you for your grace, your mercy, your steadfast love, your loving kindness, your compassion. You love us with a deep and abiding love. You gave us your only son so that everyone who has faith in him may not perish but have eternal life. Thank you, Jesus, that you were born among us. You lived our common life on earth. You suffered and died for us. You rose again. And you're always present through the Holy Spirit. We thank you that we can live in the faith that your kingdom has come and that your kingdom will finally and fully be established, that in life and in death and beyond death, you are with us. So, Lord, we thank you for this bread and this cup, which, which represents your work, your sacrifice. We pray that through the Holy Spirit, this bread may be for us the body of Christ, and this cup the blood of Christ. And as we remember your sacrifice for us, we offer ourselves as living sacrifices. So unite us to Christ as one body and give us strength to serve you in the world. And to you, uh, one holy and eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give you praise and glory now and forever. Amen. And we join with all the saints to lift our hearts in joyful praise. Holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And let's proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ has come again. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, our Lord took the cup and said, this cup uh, this cup is a new covenant uh, in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So I'd invite uh, our servers to come forward and we'll partake in communion. Thank you. So let us 
eat and drink to remember our Lord, the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Now, if you're able to um, uh, put the uh, wrapper in the basket or the garbage at the end, that would be appreciated. Uh, But what a beautiful opportunity we've had to come before God together. And remember that we're not, it's not um, like presentation and receiving. It's all of us um, doing uh, doing worship together and, and And God is our audience, so we've offered up worship to God. So let's take this time to pray. Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice for us, that we get to be with you because of all that you have done. Thank you that you love us and that you call us uh, to be your disciples in the world and to make disciples of all nations. Lord, please go before us and help us to uh, fully belong to you today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I, as a winter riser, as we respond to um, today's worship and sermon, let us all sing above all.
Our benediction comes from the last verses in the book of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of his glory with rejoicing, to the only God our Savior, uh, be, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Thank you.